times, he was the movement's artful dodger. I would do exactly the same thing today. If those sorts of laws were enacted, I would happily break those laws and encourage others to do so. A rebellious young math student by the name of Albert Langer, a rebel with a cause, the overthrow of capitalism. I enjoyed, you know, undermining American imperialism in Vietnam, and uh, why shouldn't one enjoy that? It all built towards a Friday afternoon exactly 20 years ago, May the 8th, 1970, when up to 100,000 people packed central Melbourne for the first moratorium. There were communists and Christians, pacifists and anarchists, unionists and radical students. But the vast majority of people here had absolutely no tradition of leaving their homes to publicly protest. It was the Vietnam War, and conscription particularly, that brought about temporarily an unlikely coalition of Australians. In this program, we plan to examine how all these people found themselves in political agreement. It's the story of those who fought the Vietnam War at home, where they won and where they didn't. Australia in the early 1960s, a comfortable and complacent country. I guess you know that I really go for that come on smile and those laughing eyes of blue. A little dream girl. The poverty stricken 30s, the war torn 40s, were all but forgotten. The vast majority of Australians held certain truths to be self-evident, that Australia, wholesome, white and wealthy, was the finest land on earth. That Robert Menzies could be left to make the big decisions, while the rest got on with the good life. But the good life, warned Menzies, could not be taken for granted. There was a menace to our north. Active communist fighting fronts have been opened up in Indochina, Malaya and the Philippines, where communist satellites trained and armed by their overlords in Moscow carry on intensive warfare. They carry the flag of world revolution. Are we prepared to barter our free way of life for a system more barbaric than any devised by the Roman emperors? You say, like hell we are. Brave work. Fear was directly, deliberately, overtly generated and encouraged by the Liberal Party, the National Party, uh, to such an extent that I think they started to believe it themselves. And I remind you of George Santayana's definition of a fanatic, and that is a person who redoubles their efforts long after they've forgotten their aim. And I think that sort of fanaticism infected uh, the National Party and the Liberal Party, including Sir Robert Menzies, but it did more than that. It won them elections. The government made little attempt to explain the complex reasons for the turmoil to our north. It placed little emphasis on the long struggle of the Vietnamese to free themselves from French colonial rule. It did tell us that Ho Chi Minh's armies were communist, armed and supplied by Red China. The key phrase of the era was the domino effect. It predicted that one after the other, countries would fall to communism. First Vietnam, then Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, and so on to Indonesia. In 1963, Indonesia's bellicose leader, President Sukarno, had taken over West New Guinea from the Dutch. The Japanese had proved a mere 20 years earlier that from here, it was a short step to Australia. We believed, as we always had, that we could not defend Australia on our own, and that our best insurance policy was to prove ourselves the loyal ally of our great and powerful friend, the United States. In Vietnam, the Americans were intervening to prevent the first domino from falling. Mr. President, have you ever had any reason to doubt this so-called domino theory, that if South Vietnam falls, the rest of Southeast Asia will go along behind it? No, I, I believe it. I believe it. I think that uh, 
the struggle is close enough. China is so large, looms so high on the, just beyond the frontiers. If South Vietnam went, it would not only give them an improved geographic position for a guerrilla assault on Malaya, but would also give the impression that the wave of the future in Southeast Asia was China and the communists. So I believe it. On November the 10th, 1964, Prime Minister Menzies announced conscription for 20-year-olds. It was a ballot system. Marbles inscribed with dates were drawn out of the barrel. Men born on those dates could face two years in the army if they passed a medical. There were some exemptions, but it was 18 months jail if a man refused to register. Conscription. It was an issue that had torn this chamber and the country wide apart in previous generations. In World War I, it split the Labor Party and the Australian people twice rejected it in referenda. In the darkest days of World War II, when the Japanese were on our doorstep, Prime Minister Curtin could only introduce it by promising that no conscript would be sent outside the South West Pacific Zone and that all bets were off once the war was over. Now, what Menzies did was extraordinary. He introduced it without debate in this chamber, without discussion even in full cabinet. And his political judgment was right once more, because in the electorate at large, very few seemed to even notice or to care. We've already said goodbye. So five months later, Menzies went one step further. He announced that a battalion of combat troops would be sent to Vietnam. For the first time in our history, conscript soldiers would be sent to fight far beyond Australia's shores. The government explained that our troops were sailing out in response to the urgent plea of the South Vietnamese government. But that was not true. On the evening of the announcement, Don Chip, a young Liberal backbencher, was passing the Prime Minister's office. I saw the old man there slumped in his chair he said, oh, come in, my boy. And I got the shock of my life because I thought I'd be told to just to go out. And I went in there. He said, sit down. He said, uh, my boy, I've got a problem. He said, uh, we, Cabinet has agreed to send troops into Vietnam. Uh, some bastard has leaked it to the press, one of my Cabinet ministers. The press know about it. The opposition knows about it. And we have not yet had an official request from the South Vietnamese government. One of the American high officials had been here beforehand, it might have been Lodge or somebody, and Menzies had had interviews with him, and Menzies announced it soon afterwards, saying there had been an invitation from the government in Saigon, but there had been no invitation. Uh, that came later. The Americans fixed that. Absolutely. I mean, it was the Americans uh, who pressed us to go in there and it was to the Americans that we agreed to go in. So not, yeah. not the Vietnamese. They were there. Their their, uh, their in invitation was an academic exercise. But such political niceties were blithely ignored by the young people most directly affected by conscription. All that mattered was the current fad. It would be three or four years before pop ballads gave way to protest songs. There were Australians who were outraged, but not many, and most were drawn from an older generation, accustomed to swimming against the tide. The Reverend Alan Walker was a veteran pacifist who preached against the war from the beginning, despite the disapproval of many of his fellow Methodists. Were you more opposed to the war or more opposed to conscription, do you think? Again, as opposed to war, for conscription for a so evil a war, you know, protect America by having a fight on somebody else's territory so that the communists don't come too near to us. And then for Menzies to introduce typical Australian gambling, choosing people by drawing out of a lottery barrel their year of birth and sending them off to be killed, I found that to be utterly evil way, even if you did have conscription. From the start, the pacifists had allies. A stalwart group of mothers banded together 
to save our sons, proof that even in the most conservative liberal heartland, among middle-class, middle-aged women, there were the seeds of doubt. In June 1965, 144 potential conscripts took out press ads in the name of the youth campaign against conscription. But all these protests were orderly, law-abiding, genteelly democratic. It was a conventional form of protest. Yes, yes, it was legal, mostly, or almost or wholly legal form of protest, which simply depended on the parliamentary system to uh, respond to public opinion, which we hoped to galvanise. Um, getting prominent people to sign statements that they thought that this measure was not justified, that it was monstrously unjust, that it was deeply offensive to our political and historical traditions. But the protest group still represented no more than a tiny minority. In October 1966, only weeks before the general election, Prime Minister Harold Holt welcomed President Lyndon Johnson to Australia. He was given a rapturous reception. The crowds were astonishing, as great as those that had greeted Queen Elizabeth a decade earlier. There were anti-American demonstrators. Paint was thrown at the President's car and at his bodyguards. Most Australians were shocked at such impertinence. Run over the bastards, ordered Premier Askin. In 1966, our friend and ally LBJ came out to Sydney town from his great land of USA. Some students chose to demonstrate by lying in his way, but my comment lingers on. Run, 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 the bastards over. I said to LBJ. And I would like for every Aussie that stands there in the rice paddies on this warm summer day to know that every American and LBJ is with Australia all the way. Not a boy that wears the uniform yonder today that hasn't always known that when freedom is at stake and when honorable men stand in battle shoulder to shoulder, that Australians will go all the way as Americans will go all the way, not third of the way, not part of the way, not three-fourths away, but all the way until liberty and freedom have won. Australians all rejoiced, and Australia's sons went all the way. They rolled up to the registration centres in their thousands. The country's traditional resistance to conscription seemed to have melted away in the warm glow of LBJ's enthusiasm. The old campaigners of the peace movement looked on helplessly as the election approached. Then at the last minute, a rallying point. In the full glare of a media blitz, schoolteacher Bill White refused to obey his call-up orders. I ask you, as your commanding officer, to consider your position carefully and to report as ordered so as to avoid becoming liable to the quite severe punishments which the law provides for inf infringements of military discipline. Mr White, does the telegram at all change your plans now? No, I have made it clear from July the 18th when I was dismissed from the, my teaching position that I do not intend to comply with the call-up notice and I do not intend to present myself to the military or to obey any orders of a military nature. Twenty years later, it's still easy to see why Bill White's stand had such a powerful impact. For people already harbouring secret doubts about conscription, he was an inspiration. Then, as now, he came across as clean-cut, sincere, a good Australian boy with deeply held convictions. They were asking me to go and um, kill people, and basically that was my objection. I had other objections at the time, 
Um, I objected to the particular war. I objected to conscription. But basically, I objected to the fact that I was being asked to kill another human being. Bill White preferred arrest and imprisonment to military service. He even refused the compromise offered by the army, non-combatant duties. I was offered enticements, um, that was one, non-combatant duties. But once I'd taken that first step, once I had admitted to myself that I'm part of um, the machine, part of the, the war machine, then I just would feel that I was compromising. And I just wasn't willing to compromise at that stage. White's applications to the civil courts for exemption as a conscientious objector were rejected. A judge declared that his ideas were the result of ignorance. A court-martial sentenced him to 21 days in a military prison for disobeying orders. But his dogged refusal to cooperate put the issue of conscription well and truly on the election agenda. Throughout the campaign of November 1966, Harold Holt was harassed by noisy and irreverent demonstrators. No one ever treated Bob Menzies quite like this. They are such true Democrats that they don't even want to hear what the democratically elected Prime Minister of their country has to say. the caliber of the Australian people if they think that this is how the Australian vote is going to be. One, two, three, four. Make the stop the war. We were at a stage where after years and years of Menzies' rule, where political apathy was fairly entrenched, suddenly things were changing. People saw that maybe the government isn't always right. Maybe we can do something against what the government's telling us to do and still be loyal Australians, and yet refusing certain parts of what they were asking us to do. But as far as the country was concerned, these were the loyal Australians. Later in the war, returning veterans would be quietly, almost shamefacedly, slipped back into the country. But in 1966, the public still believed they'd been defending Australia from the menace of communist invasion. Remembering we had those pamphlets during the 66 election, remember with the big red arrows and the yellow peril coming down from Vietnam? We won an election on that miss with the greatest landslide that any party had ever had in Australia. And I'll remind you, Geraldine, that that was one of the few elections ever held in this country where you could say a government sought and gained a mandate, where a, an election was held on a single issue. Didn't matter a damn about the economy, 66, nothing else. Vietnam was the only thing, the yellow hordes. For Labor leader Arthur Caldwell, who'd campaigned passionately against conscription, it was the end of the road. The ALP's new leader was not prepared to outrun popular opinion. For some years under Gough Whitlam, Labor would oppose neither the war nor conscription outright. For the protest movement, the return of the Liberals was devastating. Those who had preached that the proper route to change lay through rational persuasion and the ballot box had had their chance and failed. The 1966 election was catastrophic for the Labor Party and as a result of that failure, the youth campaign conscription really folded up and the work of the anti-conscription movement was taken over by much more militant groups who went right outside the bounds, the boundaries that we had set for ourselves. In previous conflicts, these were the images the public saw at home. Our lads bravely setting out for war. But in Vietnam, the cameras followed them into the heat of battle and showed that the victims of the war too often were ordinary peasants, the old, the women, the children. I was tremendously uh, anguished by what was happening in the, v the Vietnam War. I was, um, the, 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 the images that I remember mostly are the, 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 the Buddhists burning themselves to death, 
the, the effect of napalm on, on children and particularly that amazing photograph of a, a child of eight. And it really uh, comes home to me even more strongly now, having children of my own. That kind of... Um, I mean, one felt an enormous solidarity for you know the, the, those people there and uh, incredible admiration for their courage. So what, whatever we could do in Australia was very small compared to what was being inflicted upon them. But more radical protesters in Australia went further than sympathy for innocent civilians. They openly supported the enemy. The establishment said that Ho Chi Minh was a puppet of Chinese communism. The radicals said he was a national hero. The establishment said the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong, were ruthless terrorists. The radicals said they were freedom fighters and Melbourne students began to raise money on their behalf. The NLF is fighting a just cause in Vietnam. They're fighting for national independence. They're not all terrorists. It wasn't only the press that was outraged. Many in the peace movement were shocked too. I was bewildered why the student movement had gone in this direction to support the enemy. Uh, when, in fact, our only business was not to be in the war, or at least not with conscripts. But the radical students were unrepentant. Albert Langer, a Maoist student at Monash, was one of their most articulate spokesmen. What we were concerned about was an actual war that was going on and who was going to win it. And we saw American imperialism as, as needing to be defeated um, militarily. And therefore, by taking that sort of political stand here and saying that we are on the same side, we're, we're changing the nature of the anti-war movement. It made it a lot easier for a lot of other people, for example, to come out and be opposed to the war. But they could say before it was a radical position to be opposed to the war, mm. um, but then it became quite a moderate position to just be opposed to the war. It was a radical position to support the enemy. One of the major things we're trying to achieve is to get people in Australia into a position where they can control their own lives. One example of the radical trend in student politics was the foundation in 1968 of SDS, Students for a Democratic Society. Harry Van Morse was a founding member. Do you think you were aiming to change things or were you aiming to shock when you were with SDS? Oh no, we were very much aiming to change things. Uh, the aim was to uh, not merely stop the Vietnam War, that, that was part of it. The aim was to stop conscription. but. Uh, very early on in the peace, it became obvious that the Vietnam War wasn't an accident. It wasn't just something where governments had made a mistake in policy or something. It was an outcome of a whole series of social and economic forces um, that made uh, the United States in particular want to control the Vietnamese area, the Indochinese area and more, uh, both strategically and economically. Um, and that form of imperialism uh, as we called it, I think quite rightly, was seen to be the main cause. And to tackle that was really what became very early on the aim of not just SDS, but most of the student groupings, the radical student groupings within Australia. Immature posturing it must have seemed, but in Paris in May of 1968, the autocratic regime of General de Gaulle was rocked by a student rebellion, which for days turned the streets of the city into a battleground. The sheer effrontery of the students electrified their peers around the world. If this was the way to achieve change in France, and it did, why not in Australia? The student movement, and not just the students, but a lot of young people involved generally, believe that in fact, unless we displayed our anger and met the establishment head on in uh, a confrontation of ideas, and if necessary, of bodies, uh, that nobody's going to take any notice. On July the 4th, 1968, American Independence Day, the radicals in Melbourne put their theory into practice. Militant students marched on the US consulate. The year before, there'd been a peaceful, orderly, candlelit procession, which had caused barely a ripple. By 1968, everybody had had it with that on the campuses. And uh, I remember the Pacifist Society of Melbourne University, which I was vice president of at the time, actually debating whether or not we should throw rocks at the US consulate. Uh, now, for the Pacifist Society to do that, when we were quite clearly committed to a non-violent strategy, showed just how angry we were and how frustrated we were with the tactics of the old left. 
Yes, we're, we're, there was a very strong pacifist push that was saying that it's absolutely vital to keep everything peaceful and quiet, and more or less acting as the marshals for the police. We're just, uh, uh, we were saying that um, it's important to stir things up, that we, you know, we do want to throw bricks through the US consulate, we want to show that there is a, a very strong and militant opposition here, and we should be prepared to fight back if the police attack us. The cause of this American capitalism... The police had orders to keep the demonstrators on the footpath. The demonstrators were determined to occupy the streets. Our attitude was that the streets belong to the people, and if we want to use the streets to protest, then we have a right to do so. It was a deliberate challenge. If they couldn't confront US imperialism, they could at least confront the Victoria Police. Some older protesters were appalled by the students' tactics. I mean, they would quite blatantly organise a riot. One would say, well, listen, you uh, throw this under the horses and that'll make them rear up. And while they're, do they're tending to that, you break through the line. That'll force them uh, to... Uh, um, come and, and push you back and drive you back with their batons and uh, of course we'll get some good pictures in there and, uh, and then um, you start up a chant over here, kill the pigs. They're a little bit like controlling children while they're getting their own way, that's fine. But if the police, for law, reasons of law and order, had to impede their progress or stop them from doing something, then they became unnecessarily violent. We were marching on the street. There was no intention to be violent when we were marching into the city. They drove their police horses straight into us, rode them into us, uh, rode over people, uh, drove their cars into people, uh, just to try and force everybody back on the footpath. Did Eventually they gave up on that because they lost the battle. But in the process of that, the violent confrontation occurred. Violence continued well into the evening. The consulate was mobbed, its lawn invaded, its windows smashed with stones. Firecrackers, smoke bombs and bottles were thrown at the police. They reacted, or overreacted, with repeated cavalry charges. At least 50 demonstrators were arrested. Among them, Albert Langer, who later defended himself successfully in court. The violence here was never at any particularly high level, but certainly just accepting police pushing you around, accepting the idea that Americans can bomb Vietnam and, and, and we can't throw a brick through their windows, uh, just seemed to me absurd. If you want to stop actual, the extreme violence of wars and so on, I think you have to be prepared to fight it. But did you think uh, the police behaved well by and large? Oh no, not particularly. <laughs> the, the police and the students here cooperated <laughs> in a very destructive way. The students to try because they depended uh, on publicity. These movements depended for their momentum on publicity and, pub and there was no better publicity than a riot and there was no more dedicated or more fanatical supporter of a movement than one who had suffered for the cause and had, had been a martyr to it uh, at the end of a police baton or in a cell. But what it did of course is it got world headlines and it got headlines all over Australia. Uh, this was an ally of the United States where protesters had actually smashed the US consulate and that made a lot of people in Australia in the anti-war movement really think about well these people were so angry and they've got a right to be angry. Last night in Melbourne, mounted police... But a lot of other people in the protest movement wondered if headlines like this were held any closer. I uh, 
was strongly opposed to of any sort. Uh, I didn't necessarily oppose violence to property, but certainly any violence that would uh, affect uh, people or was likely to affect people. I, uh, I was very impressed uh, by the, um, the Guardian campaigns of non-violence. They were a major influence on my thinking, and uh, to me they'd shown the, the, the potential for such methods of uh, mobilising large numbers of people and uh, uh, keeping people on side as you were doing so. <laughs> were you ever violent personally? No, no, no. Do you think they had any impact on the course of the war? I think they prolonged it. Prolonged it? Yes. Why? I'm talking about the rat bags. I'm not talking about the genuine mm. protesters. I'm talking about the rat bags because the rat bags were able to discredit uh, the, uh, the whole protest movement and thus allay the consciences of those who were doubt doubting a little bit but sort of, sort of oh, well, look, if there's rat, rat bags like that in the thing... Overseas, in the United States and Japan, the level of violence steadily mounted. Some feared that scenes like these might be repeated in Australia. And within the movement, there were people who were prepared to consider guns and bombs. We had debates, you know, quite serious debates, particularly within the student movement at the time, about those sort of methods. Because I mean, that's the uh, next logical yes, development yes. in the revolutionary yes, struggle, isn't yes. it? The... But no, I don't think it's a logical development. I think it's a, a suicidal development in the particular context we were in. Uh, I strongly opposed uh, the use of such methods. Uh, to me, the, 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 the importance was to develop methods which, uh, while continually confronting uh, government policy and government structures, would at the same time generate a degree of sympathy and support amongst the population as a whole. And I saw any violent methods, including bombings, as a the antithesis of doing that. <laughs> On the whole, the saner voices prevailed. Australia proved infertile ground for the politics of violent confrontation. The protest movement continued to swell. More and more people were prepared to break the law. But outside a militant Melbourne fringe, passive resistance was the main philosophy. By 1969, the war itself had become the protesters' greatest ally. Year by year, the conflict had intensified. Few people now believed the war could be won quickly. Many doubted it could be won at all. But its savagery, played out night after night in Australian sitting rooms, was demoralising. By the end of the year, it became clear that American soldiers had massacred more than a hundred villagers in cold blood at My Lai. Vietnam had become a bottomless pit of human suffering. It's about this time, the middle of 1969, that things really started to happen. For the first time, a majority of Australians, according to a Gallup poll, wanted Australian troops to come home from Vietnam. Within the next year, the student protest movement would change dramatically, from a noisy minority dominated by radicals to a widespread popular movement. In October, the anti-war movement in the United States had discovered its most potent weapon, the moratorium, a nationwide stop work meeting which brought hundreds of thousands onto the streets of American cities. By the end of the year, President Nixon would respond with his policy of Vietnamization. American ground troops would be withdrawn and the burden passed on to the South Vietnamese army. American lives cost American votes. Asian lives were more expendable. In Australia, the Gordon government dutifully followed suit. Australians too would be gradually withdrawn, but neither the war nor conscription would end. The protest movement rolled on 
unappeased. We have revoked our allegiance to the Act and I urge others to do so by burning our draft card. There was no such thing as a draft card in Australia. But all over America, resistors were burning their draft cards. So in Australia, they burnt their registration papers instead. Early in 1970, the protest movement in Australia decided to adopt the most recent American innovation. Labor MP Jim Cairns led the planning for a nationwide moratorium on Vietnam. Your aim was to show the Australian people that there was a significant body of opinion who were yes, thinking Yes, that's again. right. I always said it was no good having a march unless you had thousands of people. Because you made you look silly if you... Yes, that's right. You had to have thousands of people if it was going to be effective. Raised, but but been, could it be done? Could the disparate elements of the peace movement be welded into a disciplined force, disciplined enough to influence middle Australia? But that we take no initiative in the matter. Patiently, at neighbourhood meetings around the country, Jim Cairns coaxed consensus out of chaos. Quite clearly stated there what we would do. Can you just give me a bit of a um, word picture of these meetings? Were, were they mad beyond belief? Or... Oh, at times they were manic. Harry Van Morst eventually became the vice chairman of the Victorian Moratorium Committee. We'd have meetings at, say, the Richmond Town Hall, and there would be 600, 700 people there. It would be a relatively open meeting to activists within the anti-war movement, delegates from all sorts of organisations, trade unions, church groups, you name it. And an incredible variety of attitudes and there'd be people posturing on all sorts of issues and big grandiose speeches, people stamping the floor. Uh, at one stage during, during a couple of meetings, the hall actually divided uh, with people shouting down uh, the, the opposition from one side of the hall. They, they, they were, were out in, of control a bit then. Well, in a sense, at times, I guess they weren't controlled as well as uh, the organiser would have liked. On the other hand, they led to an incredibly vibrant exchange of ideas and views. It kept the movement active. And I'm sure that it played a big role in providing the motivation to, to organise and to be passionate about it. And the passion of the moratorium movement in Melbourne was what led to the very large numbers out in the streets in the long run. The student leaders found they were no longer in control of events. The movement seemed to be growing like topsy. Out in the community, away from the labyrinthine politics of the organising committees, ordinary people were preparing their own methods of protest. Here they are working for a local demonstration that will take place on Saturday morning. They hope that a thousand people will stand in the line of conscience outside a suburban shopping centre. Volunteer workers include doctors, lawyers, clergymen, teachers, a plumber, housewives, students and even children. They're going to talk to people. You're going to talk to people? Mm. About the war. Yes, we are. What are you going to tell them about the war? Um how it isn't nice that people get killed. Despite evidence that the community had started to mobilise, no one was quite prepared for what was to come. Okay. On the morning of May the 8th, 1970, people began to converge on the centres of Australia's capital cities. So did armies of police. In Melbourne especially, it was soon clear that the numbers would far exceed the hopes of the organisers and the fears of the authorities. I talked to the police, had several discussions with them before the 8th of May, and uh, told them what was going to happen. I didn't think we'd have nearly as many people. They thought we'd have many more than I did. How many did you think you'd get? 20,000. And what did they say? Oh, 50, 50,000. Australia had never experienced anything quite like it. On both sides, there was a real fear that the day might end in violence and bloodshed. Well, a pretty motley collection of people. Um, it's pretty hard to describe it, really. You can see uh, one or two fine examples of the shock troops of the new left, members of the veterans of the old left. And right behind me here, a lot of people have never demonstrated before. And one wonders how they're feeling at the moment. Perhaps a, a bit like troops going into battle for the first time. 
wondering how they're going to react to their first taste of, or whiff of, what could it be in this context? Certainly not grape shot, at least one hopes not. I was very frightened when I attended, and I was quite a seasoned uh, marcher by that stage. Because in Melbourne it was preceded by all sorts of ghastly warnings from Premier Bolte and the Chief Commissioner of Police to the effect that if members of the public attended that moratorium and attempted to uh, take over the central business district of the city, then it would result in a bloodbath. There were editorials in the mainstream press using that very term, bloodbath. Well, it's not a question of being tougher. It's a question of making some rules and, and seeing that they're abided by. Now, if these people are genuine, and I admit some are, but I also submit that most of them are not, then they can have their demonstration. Everybody knows it's going on. They know what their cause is, no war in Vietnam and all the rest of it, by simply moving from their point of assembly through and round the city and back to where they want to have their, their talks. Now, that, that gives them their protest. But if, on the other hand, they want to engage in violence or to be destructive or to be obstructive, then the law-abiding city a citizen has to be protected. Ask you, aren't you asking for trouble by an Oh, well, now, look, just a second. What, what do you do then not to ask for trouble? Do you say, all right, Dr Cairns, take over the city, do what you said on... Uh, or reported to have said, no authority, get rid of police forces, get rid of laws, just let Cairns and his mob run this show? <laughs> At 2.30, the march leaders set off down Burke Street. Jim Cairns recently met a policeman who'd been on duty that day. He said, oh, the last time I saw you, I was on a horse, and I said, I'm not surprised. He said it was in Burke Street, near the top of Burke Street. I said, yes, that would be the 8th of May, 1970. He said, that's right. He said, and when you all came round the corner, I was shit scared. And I said, well, so was I. And he said, at 10 past 3, however, I know it. Looked at me, watch. Remember it until this day. He said, everything came all right. He said, I knew it was all right. I knew I had nothing to worry about. Tell me what you thought when you saw these thousands and thousands of people, and like people, middle class types, children, I mean, what, what did you, what went through your mind? Well, when I, when I came round the corner and saw the mass of people in the Treasury Gardens, I couldn't believe it. I felt we, we had taken over the city. The city had said, OK, it's yours, and there was no resistance. Brisbane and Perth, thousands took to the streets. In Sydney, 20,000 massed outside the town hall. But the Melbourne moratorium far surpassed the other cities. Up to 100,000 people took over the city centre. As a proportion of its total population, the Australian moratorium was bigger than anything that had happened in America. Well, it wasn't only the 100,000, there were probably another 50 or 100,000 in Melbourne who saw them from windows and everywhere else. Probably 200,000 were involved in that altogether, 150,000 anyway. Now it affected them, it was real. Uh, they went home and talked about it. Everyone would have affected probably a million people over that weekend. Let's see you now. 
but the real power still lay here. Though government spokesmen were sending out some very confused messages. Within a year of the moratorium, the government announced that all troops would be withdrawn from Vietnam. The Prime Minister at the time, Mr Gordon, said we face no foreseeable threat in the next 10 years, so the domino theory was now dead. Surprisingly enough, he did not abolish conscription at the same time, a move which would surely have derailed the protest movement in one fell swoop. No, the fact is where the war was concerned, the government was swayed far less by Sydney and Melbourne than by Washington. I don't say the Australian government was unaffected by this sort of thing, but it wasn't affected much. Uh, what uh, changed the course for the Australian government, uh, the governments of McMahon and Gordon, was that the Americans were pulling out. Now, if the Americans were going, we'd have to go. But in Australia, conscription remained. Thousands of young men by now were refusing to register for the ballot. Most of them, the government ignored. But it could not overlook the most prominent draft resistors, men like Michael Hamill Green, who openly proclaimed their contempt for the law. You must be aware of a number of legal methods by which you could avoid national service. Why have you, why have you chosen an illegal method? Because uh, all the so-called legal methods um, don't actually um, uh, threaten the system as, as such. They leave the system as uh, intact. Um, I, I don't think this is any good, my taking out a conscience objection, for instance, because it seems as if if you take out such a thing, um, you have a conscientious objection to yourself being killed, but you don't have a conscientious objection to other people going in your place or, or killing in your place, and that doesn't seem to me very conscientious. For 15 months, Michael Hamill Green was on the run in Victoria. He moved constantly from house to house. Many of his temporary hosts were respectable academics and professionals, even affluent business people, not normally the sort to shelter lawbreakers. Stayed with over 200 people. In New South Wales, Michael Matteson was doing the same thing. It was a wearing way of life. And you're moving, but you're moving you know, every four or five days. So it's, in terms of you know, close relations with family, this sort of thing, it's much the same as being in jail. In fact, I've seen my family, except for the last period, um, I've seen my family a little less often than I would if I'd been in jail, where I'd get a visit a month. I haven't seen them that often. But it was becoming harder for the draft resistors and their supporters to keep the anti-conscription issue in the public eye. Late in 1971, they announced that Michael Hamill Green and Michael Madison were both sheltering in Melbourne University and dared the authorities to take action. But we decided that, look, what if the government decides to ignore us? They just might, you know, which would be terrible. We couldn't have that. They have to come and take notice of us. So we said, well, the media might ignore us too. We'll set up our own media. So we decided we'd set up a radio station. And we put up an antenna on top of the Union building and we ran a whole lot of interviews with draft resistors. This is Radio Resistance 3DR. We're trying to give power to the people by providing an alternative to the big business owned and operated mass media. And the idea was, of course, that they couldn't ignore us if we had our own radio station. How could, how could you tune into it? What was the... Oh, it was on a band just above the ABC. <laughs> we, we figured that those people who get bored with the ABC, <laughs> when they go to flick the dial, will come across us, you see. And this was 3DR. Um, this was called 3DR for draft resistance. And that, that was going for uh, oh, about four days. And then, of course, the police came in this early morning raid, raced into the building with sledgehammers and knocked down doors and all sorts of silly things when people were there with keys to let them in. Um, couldn't find the draft resistors anywhere. Uh, didn't know what to do. And uh, the next six hours, um, the police sort of uh, rampaged through the building, smashing air conditioning, looking in every cupboard. They, they'd had intelligence, obviously. As, and Mike Madison and myself could actually hear them in the adjoining room. Uh, looking for us and saying, well, we know they're here, we know they're sleeping here. So I went racing out with this electronic gadget, which they thought, aha, we've captured this radio station, at least there's something positive come out of it. So they announced to the press, all gathered downstairs, that they'd found this uh, private radio and at least they'd achieved part of their purpose. And they went away, very happy. But what they'd in fact obtained was an electronic gadget for scanning stencils, uh, for anybody who knows, you know, for gestetnering leaflets and things. They'd taken that out of the SDS office. They hadn't found the radio station at all. The draft resistors union continued to hover between solemnity and farce. 
A year later, Madison announced he was giving himself up. Michael, can you tell us why you're giving yourself up? Um, I think at this stage it's the most effective thing I can do against conscription, me being underground. Michael Madison has changed little in 20 years. He was serious then, he is serious now. Uh, it seemed to me the only thing we had, and was still the best strategy, was the more people in jail, um, the more the issue mattered. So you wanted to force the issue, yeah. you wanted to up the ante, yeah. and you basically wanted the authorities to be confronted with the nature of their law. Yeah. And right on cue, the law arrived on Michael Madison's doorstep. It was a stagey little drama, scripted by Madison and his supporters down to the last chant, for the benefit of an appreciative press. Although they had no chance to rehearse, everyone agreed the show went well. The police especially played their part to perfection. Madison's arrest was a curtain raiser to the main event, the 1972 election. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's time. The national leader of the Australian Labor Party, Mr Gough Whitlam. There were many reasons why Gough Whitlam would win the 1972 election for Labor after 23 years of Liberal rule. One of them was that Labor had finally made up its mind to abolish conscription. That promise tapped a new reservoir of support for Whitlam. Not just the young men, but their mothers too. Older women would vote for the ALP in unprecedented numbers. Men and women of Australia, the decision we will make for our country on the 2nd of December is a choice between the past and the future. One of the Whitlam government's first acts was to abolish conscription. And within months, the protest movement which had galvanised Australia had withered away. But those who took part believe that Australia was fundamentally changed, from automatic acceptance of its elected government to automatic scrutiny. There was, you know, almost a revolution of thought. I sort of think that at that time, um, what was happening in Australia in respect to the Vietnam War and war and the um, out of protest against the bomb, all those sort of things, are, I can sort of almost see a continuity um, to what's happening now in Europe. There's a freedom of thought, there's a change in the thought pattern. And I think at that time, at that precise moment in history, that's where we were. I think it was the most significant um, action by the people in Australian history in my time that changed the attitude of the people. Um, I believe direct action, as this is, is the only form of action that the people can take that will have a significant influence on decisions in Parliament, on the political atmosphere. Only direct action will do that. And this was the strongest and clearest example of direct action that I've experienced. What are the legacies of that era then? Do you, do you grant that there are any lasting legacies for Australia of that anti-war era? I wish I could say there were, but there's not. Uh, we treat our Vietnamese veterans who we sent there against their will with contempt. There were 500 Australians killed in the jungles of Vietnam. There's been 500 ki plus killed of their own hand since they got back to Australia. We sent them there against their will. You try to hold a public meeting out there now, sympathy. We're holding a public meeting to protest against the treatment given to Vietnam veterans. You get 10 people out. But in Sydney, in November 1987, a lot more than 10 people turned up to line the streets as the Vietnam veterans were given the welcome home for which they'd waited 20 years. <laughs> 
But there's another set of veterans who watched this moment of national catharsis with mixed emotions. The nation now applauds the men who fought in Vietnam. But would it do the same, they wonder, for the men who refused to go? Harry, do you sometimes feel sympathy for the Vietnam veterans, the people who did go? Yeah, I can feel some sympathy for them, particularly those who went genuinely thinking they were doing the right thing. They haven't been treated all that well or all round. But what I'm concerned about at the moment is that the emphasis and the sympathy is going to those who were part of the war machine and the history of the war is being rewritten in the process. And people are forgetting that the, the, the most honourable veterans of that war, uh, apart from the Vietnamese themselves who suffered the most, are the draft resistors who stood up and said, we will not be pressured by this government, we will not accept the lies, we'll learn the truth and we'll stand up to it. Now, they are the people who I've got the most sympathy for, and I think they're the ones whose story is being forgotten and the, the justice of their stands is being written out of history too often.